Hey everyone, uh, my name is Nelson DeWitt and this is a Kickstarter's Guide to Kickstarter. We're looking at what it takes to successfully launch a uh, creative project online and get it funded. And today I'm talking with Dan Provost, who is one of the uh, creators of the Glyph, which is an iPod uh, uh, tripod mount. Very cool project and actually one of the earliest kind of successful projects uh, on, on Kickstarter. Uh, so to start, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, the team and where this idea came from and, and kind of how you found Kickstarter. Sure. Um, well, yeah, it was, it was just me and my, uh, my buddy Tom, uh, Tom Gearhart, who uh, he's been my friend since college, and then we uh, moved to New York to go to uh, graduate school together. Um, and then we're, you know, we're just kind of both working in the city and we, you know, we always talk about, uh, ideas for things we could work on. And, um, so we just had this idea one day, um, of this, uh, of being able to mount your iPhone, iPhone on a tripod. Um, cause we had been, or I at least had gotten the iPhone 4 right when it came out, and I realized what an awesome camera it had. So, you know, we thought, you know, this is a legitimate camera. You should be able to treat it like one and, you know, be able to mount it on a tripod. So the idea kind of evolved from there, and um, we we used uh, 3D printing to make prototypes of it. And we kind of got to a point where, you know, we realized we had something, but we didn't know like what the next steps would be to actually, you know, produce it and potentially sell it to people. And that's kind of where Kickstarter came into the mix. And I had, I had heard of it and I had used it before. Um, like I had funded, um, the, uh, the designing Obama book. So that was kind of like my introduction to Kickstarter. And so I just thought, you know, we, we both thought it was such an awesome platform. So we decided to just, give it a shot with, you know, fairly low expectations. Our, our funding goal was uh, $10,000 and with the idea of maybe we would make 500 of them with kind of like a cheap aluminum uh, injection molding process. And then um, it'd be kind of like a fun little side hobby. And, you know, almost a year later and, you know, we, we both quit our jobs and we're kind of doing this, uh, this design thing, uh, full time. So it's been kind of really unexpected and, and crazy, but really exciting also. Yeah. So you did, uh, you did designing Obama as well? No, that was the first, uh, that was my introduction to Kickstarter oh, as okay. I you, you uh, pledged towards that book. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Um, yeah, that, cause that was another sort of big one early on that was, that was quite successful. Yeah. Yeah. And so you kind of came into it as an outsider or, or a backer and then you said, Oh, Hey, this might be something that I could use. Right. Yeah, exactly. And the, the Obama book, it was kind of, it, it was almost like too good to be true. Just like the way Kickstarter works as a, as a thing on the internet, it's like, you know, I didn't believe that I was actually like a helping this thing happen. And then B I would get like this nice hardcover book at the end. Like it seemed too good to be true. So then when it actually like did happen and I got this like book in the mail that I helped, you know, fund, you know, the creation of, it was like a really fulfilling experience. So that's, you know, kind of when we realized that Kickstarter was, you know, some, there was really something powerful there. Yeah. And then you kind of got to experience that whole thing for yourself, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So why don't we talk a little bit about, uh, you know, you hear about Kickstarter and you kind of have this idea. How did you prepare? Like how much research did you do before uh, launching your project to uh, kind of get ready for it? Yeah, so we, um, you know, at the time, there weren't too many, uh, like, industrial design type projects on Kickstarter. So we you know, we scour the site and we try to find similar projects, not necessarily like Apple related, but just they're basically any project that was selling a product and see, you know, how did they make their video? How did they do their pricing tiers? Um, and, you know, go from there. So there were a few projects. There's this one project that I remember. It was like a, a little plastic 
mustache that would like clip to a 20 ounce soda bottle so when you're like drinking a soda it like looks like you have a mustache uh so we like i remember we used that as a guide for like how they did their uh pricing tiers and stuff um but yeah it was just like you know all about um you know using other projects as precedents and then there was this um the craig mod uh blog post uh, where he talks about his whole experience with using Kickstarter uh, to fund a, a book that he made, um, the Art Space Tokyo book. Yep. Um, that blog post was really useful also for just, um, there was a lot of like pricing psychology in it, you know, like how people are, were like willing to bid for certain tiers and stuff and, you know, just like tips for, you know, how to lay out your project. So that was helpful as well. And then, you know, we knew we wanted to do a video and um, part of it. So, uh, so that was, you know, included as well. Yeah. Uh, so you looked at other Kickstarter projects and mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, that's a good place to start. A lot of people do that. And uh, I've read that Chris Maud blog post and it's really great uh, mm -hmm. has a lot of useful information uh, so I guess the the next thing um, is the sort of big three questions of how long how much and rewards yeah you know, so those are the <laughs> the three things that like you really have to think about when you go into it right right so what did you guys how did you guys you know so uh, so for how much uh, we decided on so for the funding goal it was ten thousand dollars and we basically arrived at that figure just like a rough estimate based on some quotes we had gotten from uh, a manufacturer like how much would the mold cost and how much would the per part cost be um and then kind of roughly factoring in like shipping too um so for like five for 500 orders at twenty dollars a piece, we figured it would be about ten thousand um, dollars. And then, um, in terms of the funding period, uh, we chose thirty days, which um, was we kind of chose that based on again uh, some advice from uh, Craig Mod's blog, blog post, where we knew anything longer than 30 days was kind of unnecessarily long. Like it's either going to hit or it's not. And if it doesn't, then you're just kind of like dragging it out. Um, so I think 30 days is generally, it seems like, you know, just like looking at projects that seems to be the sweet spot. And I would say, you know, projects in general could probably even be shorter because, you know, the, the attention span of things on the internet is, definitely much shorter than 30 days. Um, but I think that's like a, a pretty, a pretty nice number. So that's kind of how we arrived at that. And then what was the last question? The tiers? Uh, tiers. Yeah. How do okay. you price it? So that, that again was, um, kind of looking at other projects to get ideas because, you know, when our whole project was just selling one product, it's like, how do we come up with just more than one tier where it's like you pledge and you get this thing, you know, coming up with uh, creative options. So, um, you know, we looked at other examples and we, we like the idea of like as a special reward for people who pledge a little bit more to get like a prototype. So, um, you know, if they pledged $50, they would kind of get in on the action a little early and we'd mail them a prototype before the actual uh, glyph and then uh, we had this like $250 tier which was like um, we would take you out to dinner basically <laughs> and um, that was like kind of successful too which uh, surprised us a lot um, you know we weren't we just kind of put it in there kind of as a joke or figured maybe like a friend or, so or someone would uh, yeah. would pledge to that but uh, it ended up I think we had like 20 people pledge to that so that was um, looking cool at it, too. you had twenty five backers at, at two hundred fifty dollars. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and I think, um, in, in, ter in the terms of the uh, the pledges, uh, I, again, the Craig's Craig mods. Uh, there's a lot of like psychology there, where it's like, 
if you have a higher dollar amount pledge, then like the lower one becomes more appealing or, you know, kind of vice versa. You can kind of like set it up in a way where certain tiers look more uh, enticing. Yeah. Um, so there's like something to that also, I think. Um, we had a, uh, I can look at it now, the, the lowest that we had a $5 tier, which the the idea behind that was kind of we didn't want the twenty dollar tier to be the lowest tier we wanted like one below it but in hindsight it seemed a little bit unnecessary like you know it it was kind of just there as filler I guess so I don't other projects might have a different take on that but um, it seemed like if people wanted to give a dollar then they could like you don't need a tier for that sure yeah. Um, so what's interesting, uh, you know, since you read that Craig Maud post and it seems like a lot of your stuff went off of that, you know how mm -hmm. he talks about how this sort of range between, I think it's 50 and 150 is mm -hmm. really sort of the sweet spot in terms of pricing and getting the most mm -hmm. kind of backers and you have this 250. One thing I see a lot is people putting like a thousand, ten thousand dollars to fund their project and like you sort of wonder like who... Who's going to back that? You know, who's going to go at that level? Do you have any thoughts yeah. about like going ridiculously high on having like really high tiers, like a thousand yeah. dollar tier? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, there are definitely a lot of uh, generous people out there. I've seen some uh, film projects that are like it, they have tiers in the thousands, where it's like you'll get a executive producer credit or um, something like that, but. I, I don't know. That's so out of my wheelhouse or like understanding of the type of person that would kind of jump in to do something like that, that I don't know. I guess it, it must work for some projects or, or maybe it does work for some projects, but in general, we didn't really have any interest in, in a tier that high. And um, I, I guess what's also appealing about not having a big tier is the beauty of Kickstarter is the people who pledge, they become customers or supporters, but they, they're not investors, which is kind of an important distinction. And I would think if you did have a tier that was thousands of dollars and someone was pledging toward it uh, and it was like a large percentage of your total funding goal, uh, it would feel like they were kind of investors in in one way or another that maybe would make people uncomfortable because they they aren't actually investors like they're not buying a, a percentage of, of the company by doing that so we we've kind of stayed away from it but I'm not gonna say you know it, it, it couldn't work in you sure. know in some situations but, but I think you, you also make a good point of uh, you know you now have five hundred and two. 5,273 patrons, supporters, backers, whatever you want to call them, people that you can directly talk to. And I think mm -hmm. that value is is sort of miss, uh, is under, I um, don't know what I'm trying to say, but undervalued mm -hmm. by a lot of people. You know, mm -hmm. you could get a, a 10,000 backer and be done, but then you have one person to talk to. And yeah, at 10,000, you probably know them. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean... Uh, definitely like the the value of kind of building an audience um, that is it you know invested in your product and excited about it is yeah that that can't be uh, overstated how important and valuable that is for sure yeah so then uh, how much time did you put into sort of the story element of the project let's say the the project page itself you know the video the text that goes up there mm -hmm. just kind of telling this whole because you had kind of an interesting video where you went back and you know you know you went through this iteration testing process and you kind of talked about that and then mm -hmm. you know what you're trying to do so well, what did you do to, to get ready for that stuff? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, we definitely put a lot of thought into the project page and wanted it to be carefully crafted, um, to, you know, to show that we cared about, you know, what we were doing and, and what we were putting out there. And then also to 
make our story and you know the reason we needed funding and why we thought the product was cool you know you want to make that story as as crystal clear as possible so um, I think we did like three iterations of the video um, just trying to get it right every time we would do it um, it just it didn't feel quite right um, and it it was, it's like, it was, it's, if you're not an actor, it's, it's really hard to kind of speak in front of a camera and like film yourself. Um, so that part was actually like pretty tough to, you know, get comfortable enough um, to where, you know, you, you sound natural and, um, you know, not awkward, I guess. Um, so there was that. And then, yeah, all, all the wording of the text and stuff, it is definitely, you know, heavily considered and you know we, we spent some time for sure you know crafting that so that everything was as as clear as possible and you know even you having said all that there were still some things that we certainly could have done better um like all the shipping stuff was confusing um because it was like an added dollar amount to the tiers so um you know you can do the best you can but there's probably always going to be things that are confusing or you know, misunderstood. Sure. Yeah. It, and uh, you wrote a lot of this in, in your blog post, which mm -hmm. um, I read as well. I, I think it was a very good uh, summary, much like uh, um, Dan Mods of the entire process. I, I like mm -hmm. that blog post just because it covered, you know, from the initial idea all the way to shipping woes. Right. Know, and right. Like how right. your shipping strategy changed. Over mm -hmm. time, based on all this, all the backers that you you got in the project, so that was a very helpful resource as well. Um, when you started the project, how much time did you kind of put into thinking about who's the audience, who are the customers, uh, and then like kind of reaching out to them? Uh, like before we launched it on Kickstarter, or. Yeah, like I mean, did you spend any time before launching thinking about you know like who's who's gonna like this thing, or did you just kind of like throw it out there and and you got lucky? We kind of just threw it out there. Um, it was, I, I guess, it was one of those like intuitive things, and it, it's kind of the way that that Tom and I are are trying to operate, where we think we're we have similar sensibilities to a lot like a, a pretty sizable niche of Apple customers or early adopters or, or whatever or, uh, people designy people interested in design like there's there's definitely a crowd where if we think something is cool then probably some other people out there will think it's cool too and so like the glyph is something that we wanted, like we designed it because we we wanted it ourselves to use. So we figured, you know, if we thought this thing was cool and it like had value and it was really handy that, you know, maybe some other people would. But yeah, in terms of any kind of market research or anything, uh, we didn't do anything like that. We just kind of put it out there. And that's the beauty of Kickstarter and kind of the point of Kickstarter is you can, you know, throw some ideas out there and see if they have legs or not. Yeah. Um, so you kind of threw it out there, but uh, I'm assuming that you had some sort of strategy or, or thought process as to how you were going to kind of initially get the word out about it. Yeah. Well, there was. Um, so we kind of uh, we touch on this a lot, and, and it's in that blog post. This like uh, John Gruber effect, where it really just takes one person like a, a, a an Oprah like figure to uh to for an idea to kind of spread like wildflowers wildfire uh so you know we knew that like i said there there is like a kind of a crowd of people that you know appreciate design and are into like apple products and these these type of things and so we uh, we sent an email to John Gruber, um, who runs Daring Fireball, which is like a, a very uh, kind of well-read uh, Apple commentary blog. Um, 
And so, yeah, I mean, we were really lucky that he he thought it was cool, and he so he linked to it the our Kickstarter project on his site, and um, it kind of just snowballed from there. So from his site, all of the like Gizmodo and the the Apple blogs and stuff linked to it as well. So um, yeah, I, I guess in terms of advice, it's this idea that whatever your project is on Kickstarter, there's there's probably someone out there who could be considered an expert or is like blogging or writing in the same area that your project fits in. So, you know, seek them out and, you know, show them your project and, and see if they're um, interested in it. You know, it's not, you don't have to go to the, to the to the big sites like your your project's not going to explode if it gets on New York Times you know it's going to explode if you if you kind of hit the audience perfectly and and where your project sits is that's where the the conversation is happening like that's what's going to be helpful right so go out and look for them right and what's kind of like based on your traffic was that email sort of the first thing that you did when you started the project or you know yeah we well I. So I have like just a little a little blog, and so I did a blog post right when uh, the project went live, and then kind of that same night I sent an email to to John Gruber, letting him know that, about the project, and that was pretty much it. I mean, I think throughout that the following week we sent some random emails to people that we thought might be interested, but. That was that was the main thing, and we just got you know incredibly lucky that he posted about it the next day, and it kind of all the publicity kind of happened on its own because you know he started the snowball, and it just kind of went from there. Yeah, so I'm assuming you you wrote him right away and say, hey, check out our cool project link, you know, blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. No, I'm saying that kind of tongue in cheek. Uh, mm -hmm. You, um, I think you wrote in your your blog post that you had kind of a relationship with him beforehand is that is that correct yeah so i mean very modest basically he he had linked to my blog a couple times in the past like i had done a a, a couple posts about like iphone interfaces and stuff that he had linked to on daring fireball so yeah, I was fortunate enough to where he at least knew who I was. I wasn't just a stranger, like, emailing him blindly. Um, so I think that also helped a lot where, um, you know, he was willing to at least look at it as opposed to just, like, a total stranger. Um, so that, I I'm sure that, that helped as well. Yeah, so sort of I'd say the takeaway is uh, – you know, don't reach out, don't spam someone that you don't really know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's that's this like whole idea is. I mean, I, and I make this assumption, and, and maybe it's not correct, but like if you're passionate about something and you're and you're doing this project, you're probably already embedded in a community that has to do with your project in some way. You know, whether you're following blogs that have to do with uh, your project or um, or maybe blogging yourself or just or being involved in that community in some way already to where whenever you have something that may be of interest to people, yeah, you're not just like blindly uh, spamming people, but it actually, you're just kind of like inserting yourself into the conversation instead of you know, spamming people essentially. So that's what it should feel like. And if it doesn't feel like that, then um, I would say something is is off. Um, you know. Yeah, and, and I, uh, you know, I kind of uh, listening to you talk about the way that you kind of launched it. It goes back to this idea that you mentioned earlier, where you say, you know, if you kind of put it out there for thirty days, and because people are going to like it or they're not, you know, yeah. and you just kind of go from there. And see if uh, if people do. And as you said, you were fortunate that sort of the right person at the right time liked it and was willing to share it. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of took off. And if you look mm -hmm. at the the traffic on your link, I think it's like within the first three four days you had like three thousand views because mm -hmm. it just you know mm -hmm. popped mm -hmm. on all the on all the sites and it took mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. 
so uh, so that's it. You you just emailed this guy and uh, he picked it up. Uh, yeah. Is there is there anything else that you did like in that um, initial launch that you think worked well or, or didn't work or? Um, I'm trying to remember. I mean, I do know we like we eat after kind of uh, you know John Gruber um, and we were kind of we felt pretty well covered in the like Apple uh, the world of like Apple blogs and stuff that. We tried uh, like reaching out to um, I think some other like writers or bloggers, um, and you know didn't didn't get an answer or, or any kind of post or anything. So that's you know certainly you know going to happen. Like not everyone is not just always going to post when you email them uh, something. So so yeah, but I mean beyond beyond that, I, there's that's really all you can do, I, I guess. Um, is just try to get people to see your project. <laughs> yeah. uh, so how do you um, how do you feel about sort of uh, the ask portion of Kickstarter and, and uh, clarify a little bit where some people on Kickstarter they're saying you know please donate to my project and help us out and be successful out of the goodness of your heart versus mm -hmm. others who say you know uh, you're pre-ordering and it's very sort of commercial. Right. Right. Where, where do you and... think that that Kind of it's, it, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, and something we're running into a little bit uh, with our, our latest Kickstarter project um, with the Cosmonaut. Um, but the way we did the glyph is we did call it a pre order because that's, that's what we want it to feel like is like you're giving money. And it will turn into this object that we will make for you. So that was kind of the satisfaction of that designing Obama book I did is like I donated money, but it like turned into this object that I could have like bought at a store. You know, I could have gone to a store and paid the same amount and got it. So that was a really uh, kind of satisfying exchange. Um, so that's how we set it up. But it's tricky because. It's Kickstarter still needs to be understood as a platform where, you know, the product doesn't exist yet. <laughs> so, like, there's going to be, there might be a hiccups or uh, things might change or this and this. So, I, I think if you, if you push it so far in the commercial direction where uh, it just feels like you're buying something as you would on Amazon, then that's not quite what the platform is for, I think. And, and it's going to kind of uh, maybe sour the experience for these other projects. So like, for example, uh, on one end of the spectrum, there's like um, Frank Chimero, I think that's how you say his name. He did also did a, a book. He wanted to write a book. So he did a Kickstarter project and he had nothing. Like all he said was, I'm a writer, you know, I like design and I want to, I want to write a book. And he raised like $112,000 just because people really like his writing because he's a blogger, but there's like a, a full trust in, you know, this guy's, I have no idea what it's going to be, but I trust that this guy's going to produce something cool. And then, uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, it's like you have the thing, basically the product basically finished and you're like, just give us money and you can buy this thing. Um, so yeah, I, I would be a little worried about it pushing too far in that direction where it just becomes like a weird version of Amazon. Um, so yeah, hopefully it can, it can kind of stay where people understand that they're supporting an idea and they're supporting, you know, designers or, or entrepreneurs and, um, that's kind of like what the platform is, is all about. It's like this mix of, of patronage and um, kind of consumerism. It's not just pure consumerism. Yeah, and it's interesting you, you say that because there's a project that I ran into recently and I don't want to like name names or anything, mm -hmm. but I think that you know it almost went too commercial where it was mm -hmm. like, you know, and, and the people talking about it, obviously they were passionate about the project. You know, I think it was a company launching a 
a product. Mm -hmm. And when they talked about it, they had the different employees on there, but it was all this sort of, you know, like our product is blah, 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 you know, it, and it yeah. sort of missed the mark with this very personal, like, this is a project we've been working on for a year and blah, 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 blah. You know, it was almost too commercial. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they still, they still got funded, so mm -hmm. who knows, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I definitely like what you're saying that, you know, there's a little more to it than just buy now. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, let me see here. Yeah, so I, I'd love to know a little bit more about uh, the Cosmonaut project. Like, did you learn any lessons from the first one uh, that you used in the second one? What was, what was that like? Yeah, well, Cosmonaut has definitely been uh, a pretty wild ride so far and um, frustrating and, and stressful also, mm -hmm. but uh, we're, we're hanging in there. Um, but yeah, uh, kind of based on the Glyph project, you know, we, we learned a few things um, just in terms of how to set up the project. We um, we simplified the tiers so there all the shipping stuff was kind of embedded and there was no kind of confusion um, created there. Um, but for the cosmonaut, we wanted to kind of play with the Kickstarter system uh, a little bit, so we did like a limited pay what you want tier. So we said the cosmonaut is going to retail for $25, but we opened a tier that had 3,000 slots in it where you could pay any any price you wanted and you would get one. So you could pledge a dollar or you could pledge $5 or you could pledge $50 and you'd get a Cosmonaut. So we had a $50,000 funding goal and so 3,000 slots. So those kind of like played against each other. They kind of kept everything in check. So like if 3,000 people only pledged a dollar, then obviously like the funding goal wouldn't be met and and uh, nobody would get a cosmonaut. So it was kind of this like psychological like game theory kind of thing where, you know, it's like, what is it worth to you? And, you know, um, things like that. So we did that. It was, and it was, it was pretty interesting how people reacted to it. Um, and we filled up, 3,000 slots in, I think, two days in, like, the first 48 hours. And we were just shy of our $50,000 goal. I think we were at, like, 40, 45,000. Um, so we had, like, you know, 28 days left, and all the slots were filled. Like, there were no – no one could pledge anymore. So we kind of decided to just – keep that tier, but open these other unlimited tiers at the retail price of $25 so that people who missed out on the pay was you want could still get in at the retail price and then that would push it over, over the edge so the project could actually be funded and we could move forward. Um, so that was, you know, that was a lot of fun and kind of an interesting twist to the, like I said earlier, the Kickstarter is like this mix of like patronage and like consumerism. So when you kind of strip away pricing expectations and you say, you know, you can pay whatever you want, like what does that what does that mean um, to people who use the site? Um, so that was pretty interesting. And then um, basically, uh, what we've learned from this project is. Uh, I guess some things are harder to manufacture than others. Um, we've been having a hard time producing this thing just because the material is so kind of delicate and tricky to deal with. It's it's much harder to manufacture than uh, what we use for the glyph because it has all these like additional properties that are needed for it to function properly. Um, so there was definitely some like naivete uh, creeping in there where we we were basing the expectations of this project on the past ex experience of our glyph project and all of our estimates were kind of based on that. Um, but it turns out this has been like you know a totally different beast in terms of you know how it's being produced and stuff. So, um, but what's been interesting about that is it's really brought to the to the forefront, um, the type of people that use Kickstarter to support people making something 
and then the type that use it that see it as just another way to buy things. Because like whenever we post an update that's like talking about manufacturing problems or shipping delays, there's kind of a mix of comments where some people are like, you know, encouraging like you you know you guys are doing great, uh, you know we're here to support you, things like that, and then other people that are like, you know, I want this now or like this is taking too long. I would just rather have a refund and just buy like a stylus from. Amazon or something. So it is kind of interesting that this ha has brought to the forefront these like two different views of, you know, what Kickstarter is and how you should respond to it. So that's been pretty interesting. Did you have any surprises with the uh, with the pledge anything you want model? Like did anyone, you know, pledge more than you you really thought or was it in that $25 it, ballpark? Um well, it was, there were a couple surprises. Like, some people pledged, like, we had a handful of people that pledged, like, well over $25, like, in the in the hundreds of dollars, just because they, like, thought it was cool and, and wanted to help out and wanted to kind of ensure that the funding goal would be met. And then, of course, there was, like, a handful of people that just pledged a dollar, too, because, you know, they, they wanted to get in on, like, a sweet deal. Um, so yeah, I, I I think in terms of the the spread of dollar amounts of how people pledged, I say it, it probably kind of met expectations or it exceeded them a little bit. Like I guess I probably pessimistically expected people to take more advantage than they did. I would say on the whole, people were pretty you know honest and pledged uh, what they considered like a fair amount. Yeah. The the dollar pledge is definitely something that's interesting to me. I know on on this current uh, uh, Kickstarter project for the ebook, um, it's been interesting just to have people kind of come in uh, who are, you know, I, I look at the backers and most of them have backed other projects, you know, like mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20, whatever, and they're pledging one, two dollars just to get uh, uh, like an early release of the PDF. Which mm -hmm. you know, in my mind, isn't isn't um, that much of a value proposition, so mm -hmm. to speak. You mm -hmm. know, but it's just interesting. You know, they're like, oh, that looks like a cool project. I'm gonna you know help out. Or, or yeah, something. yeah. And, and part of it too is like I think um, since these are people who are backing several po projects, you know, if you're backing 170 projects, you're not exactly gonna spend twenty five dollars on each project. Right, right, right. Exactly. I think uh, Kickstarter has probably. My guess to that is they've created a uh, like a psychological effect similar to the pleasure of bidding on something on eBay when eBay was so cool back in like 1999 or whatever it was. Um, like you would bid on stuff that you didn't even really need. Um, just because it was fun to like bid on stuff and there was an, an excitement there. And I think the same is true for Kickstarter where sometimes it's not the same excitement as waiting for an auction to end, but there's a certain gratification with, you know, helping someone um, kind of achieve uh, a project they want to do. So I think there's definitely uh, a, a psychology and a, and a reward beyond just whatever you're going to get for pledging a dollar or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm actually really interested to see how it kind of evolves because the, the kind of cool thing about Kickstarter is that uh, everyone has the same sort of three limitations, price, rewards, and length, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm interested to see how people play with those going forward, you know, because I think, um, you know, you can have the standard tiers and that works for 90% of the projects, but to do something really creative, like what what you did, pledge whatever you want, mm -hmm. I think really sort of, you know, is creative in its own right. Uh, for example, I saw this um, project recently that is trying not to get funded. So it's all about like, you know, getting up to a certain dollar amount within $1 <laughs> of the goal mm -hmm. and then not having it fund, which mm. is like $5,000. And I'm like, well, what happens if it goes over? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know the yeah. project's a failure, but yeah. you know so it's, it's a little weird. But yeah, uh, it's also kind of interesting, you know, to see what how people are going to play with this idea. Mm 
Um, so uh, we're kind of wrapping up on the questions that I had to ask. But if anyone's okay. watching and uh, wants to ask questions, uh, I'll take them in the Ustream or tweet me at the wit N. Um, and sort of my last final wrap up question for you is what advice would you give to other people interested in, in Kickstarter and running a project on it? Um, yeah, this is, I mean, the, the simplest thing I can say is if you're thinking of doing a Kickstarter project, then just do it. Um, so, like, if you're asking yourself, should I do this, the answer is yes. I'm telling you now, the answer is yes. Uh, because there's no, there is just such little risk and no harm done from making a Kickstarter project. Like, that, that is the beauty of it, is the financial stuff is removed. That's why you're doing Kickstarter is to gain the finances to move forward with a project. So kind of once you take that out of it, um, really the only risk is, I guess, like being embarrassed if it doesn't get funded or, you know, things like that. But that is not uh, reason enough to not, you know, move forward with. So, you know, you've got this great platform and a, a great opportunity. You know, my advice would be just, do whatever you are thinking of doing. <laughs> and if it doesn't work, you can try again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like you've really lost nothing if your project doesn't get funded. So um, yeah. just go I, for it, you know. Actually, in the, you know, on, on the site, they list uh, different blog posts. And one of the blog posts mentioned this woman who, who did, a, um, did a project, it failed. Then she redid it and changed her pitch and changed, you know, what she was doing. And it was successful, you know, and, and so it's fascinating. You sort of learn, you know, how, uh, communication and all these mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I think you make a great point of just try it and see what happens. You know, mm -hmm. what do you have to lose? Right. Know? And that's, you know, one of the things I personally tried to do with this project is I said, you know what, even if I don't get the, the funding for it, I'll put it out anyway. You know, mm -hmm. it might not be as good a product in the end, but you know, here it is, you know, that, that's sort of the whole point that you're, you're going into it, uh, not because you're trying to make money or something like that, because you want to do the, the project. Right. Right. So, all right. Well, thank you very much for your time. This has been, uh, this has yeah, been great. Absolutely. And, uh, yours, yeah, this was an interesting interview because you were one of the people that a lot of other people referenced, you know, especially in the product yeah. design space, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, we saw glyph and blah, 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 <laughs> you know, so. They probably start on Daring Fireballs. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks a lot, and I uh, hope no you have problem. a good day. You too. Thanks. All right. See you. Bye.